Hey, what's up, guys? I just want to take a second and welcome y'all to Well House at Home. I'm Chase. And I am Mandy. And we want to thank you guys for joining in with us today. You know, this week, Jason asked us to read James 1. And in this story, it talks about trials and finding joy in trials. And as we discuss it with each other, you know, we, they, we have faced some trials in our lives. And we just want to share some of those thoughts on what we've experienced. One of the trials that I've experienced in the past was graduating college and trying to find a job. And in that two year span of not having a position, it was very hard and frustrating. And I didn't understand what God was doing in that moment. I was just angry. And I finally got a position at a school in Gallatin. And it's really the things that I learned there and the people that I met at that position that I worked at for three years really kind of set me up for the job that I have now. And in those moments, I didn't un understand at the time, but I was learning a lot of things and meeting a lot of people that ultimately set me up to be successful now at the position that I have. And so now I'm close to home and I'm at a school that I love and I enjoy teaching and I think about those times when I had just a small number of kids and could do really, really fun lessons. And so that experience was, um, it was hard and it was a trial, but I found the joy in it. And I found many people that I still speak to today. You know, and for me, as I read through this story, the one trial that stuck out to me for myself was last year, um, I lost mom. And mom was one of my closest friends and it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with. But one thing that most people don't know is that Mandy and I lost a baby that week as well. So, um, you know, in a one week span, I lost my mom and we had a miscarriage. And it's probably the hardest thing that I've ever dealt with. And in the midst of it, it seemed like our world was just coming down on us. But looking back, I can see the joy that we experienced in that because God surrounded us with people who told us stories that made us laugh and who cried with us and loved on us and hugged with us and just showed us what it means to have community and family. And uh, there was joy in this trial. And I know you guys are going to go through trials. Um, and when you do, look for that joy and remember that God is good and God's going to continue to love on you and provide for you. And we asked that today, you know, you just prepare your hearts and I hope that you see joy in this experience and throughout this worship today.
There is a name A ring to thou contention Whose power can't be questioned or contained With humble faith He rules the earth and heavens His glory knows no measure or refrain And it's bursting past the border
Hey, what's up, Wellhouse partners, friends, community, uh, not just from Nashville, but we are learning that uh, we're having watchers from all over the place. And so we just want to welcome you to Wellhouse at home today. And uh, we're really excited. I hope you've had a great week. Uh, we're excited to hear we're starting a new series today called Life Hacks. And so we would love to create some interaction over the next few weeks. And so we would love for you to drop a note or uh, a comment on one of our social media links sharing your favorite life hack. All of us have those kinds of life hacks. And we would love to just see kind of what is on everybody's list. So let me give you my one of my favorite uh, life hacks. And surprise, surprise, it has to do with shoes. For those that don't know, I'm a huge shoe guy. And so one of the questions I get all the time is how do you keep your whites so white. And, and if you're not a shoe person, you don't understand this, but it, it is super important to keep the white white. And so if somebody steps on my toe or you get caught out in the rain, there's just going to be times you got to get home and whiten these babies up. And so one of the things I do, and so I'm going to give you my life hack on that, here's all that you need to make this happen. You need an old toothbrush. You're going to need some toothpaste. You're going to need some just plain old baking soda. And then here's the special ingredient. You're going to need some good old fashioned dish soap. And so what you do is you mix all these things together with a little bit of warm water, take the toothbrush out and you begin to work on those spots that got smudged. You can't have that smudge. And then you're going to wipe it off with a little bit of a, a damp rag and boom, whites stay white. We love these little life hacks and all it is, it's just dish soap, baking powder, and toothpaste. But it's these moments where something that looks really difficult becomes way easier because we were introduced to something, we call them life hacks, that makes life easier. Can I tell you that there are life hacks when it comes to spiritual things? There are life hacks when it comes to financial things, relationship things. There are these life hacks that God sprinkles through inspired writers all throughout the, the scripture, all throughout the Bible. He sprinkles in these life hacks. And one of the biggest life hack givers is a guy named James. If you don't know anything about James, James was the brother of Jesus. And so he was one of the leaders in the early church. And so he writes this book or a letter to some people that he says, hey, I want to give you some life hacks, some real practical advice. I want to give you some some, some wisdom about how to handle things differently, how to make decisions differently, how to handle moments differently. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look through James and see what life hacks we can kind of put in our tool belt uh, to keep things white, so to speak. And so in James chapter 1, James writes, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So life hack number one has to do with trials. And I don't know about you, we're living in this world right now. How many of you are under some sort of, of pressure right now that you would consider a trial? How many of us, past or present, have dealt with these moments in life where you go, I really wished I knew something or knew someone that would alleviate some of the pressure right now, that would alleviate some, some element of this trial right now? How many of us live in this world right now where you go, I would take anything to make this moment easier? And James is going to unfold some things that says, hey, you want to know how to deal with trials? Well, here's the life hack. Consider it pure joy. But there's something that doesn't set well with that. You're telling me that the life hack to dealing with my trial is just to consider it joy. And so I get asked all the time when I tell people, you know, kind of this, when we have this sort of discussion, how's that even possible? I mean, I'm in trial and the opposite of trial is joy. Those things don't go together. Well, can I tell you that before we dive into this, then we're going to get there next week on James 1. I think there's something we have to do to turn inward to adjust, if you will, the focus or the lens of our heart. We have to have a different perspective when it comes to our heart. So what I want to do today is I was given something a while back by a guy named Kevin Myers that really shapes the way that I think about these things, and I think it will for you too, but it really, it, it's, it's almost like the manual to the life hack. In order for us to fully benefit from James in order for us to fully benefit from some of these tough teaching moments where scripture really goes, I'm not sure that's possible in these in the circumstance or in these moments, there's got to be an understanding or a baseline to what it is that's going on or what it is that's going on inside of us in order for us to be able to not only interpret or get through, but to really benefit from these moments. 
And so Jesus was kind of a guru of, of laying out what it is that exposes these perspectives or exposes these moments or the quality of our heart. And so Jesus would tell stories. He would tell these things called parables. And it's just a story with kind of a, a spiritual truth or maybe sometimes it's a relational truth or a financial truth. And it was moments where there was self-evaluation that led to something that would cause us to make a decision that would be greater, that would benefit us more in whatever it is that we were dealing with. And he tells one of these in Matthew 13. It's the parable of the sower. And so it's about a farmer who goes out and he begins to scatter seed on soil. He just kind of throws seed out. And, and Jesus says that the seed, which represents God's truth, it represents some fundamental truth that cannot be avoided. He says it scatters over different kinds of soils. And he points out that there are four different kinds of soil that it hits. And these represent the four different kinds of hearts that are found in, in people. You, as you see today, you will fit into one of these four categories. Your heart, your soil, will be represented in Matthew 13 in one of these four places. And so what he does is he describes the first soil as this. He says that the first is a hard heart. And what they do is they reject any seed any of God's truths that are thrown to them. In fact, they reject God in general. It's just this moment where the seed is put there, but, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it's not needed. It's, it's overlooked. It's trampled. It's brushed aside because there is a rejection. Then the, the second one is a soft heart. And what happens there is, is, is that it receives the seed and begins to grow. And I would attest that the next are also soft hearts. They also receive the seed that is there. Then Jesus describes something. So he describes that there are four hearts. There's the, the hard heart. There's the soft heart. There's the uh, weed heart. And then there's the fruitful heart. And so then he says that something is going to come that is going to determine what happens next. He says that in this, there's going to be heat, or what we're gonna call pressure. That heat is going to come and bake down on every single one of these. And every category, it doesn't matter if it's the one that rejects God and his truth, the ones that receive are all going to feel some sort of pressure. Now, at this point, here's what you need to know. It's the same seed that is being sown on every single one of these. But the response to the heat, the response to the pressure is different in every single one of these. So in order for us to be able to set up the trial part of this and how we're going to respond to it, we got to know where we're at on this. And so here's what we, we get. In the hard, rejected heart, the response is going to be this. When we feel pressure, I serve me. The hard heart says, I serve me. It's this concept that all people are, are good people, and therefore if something bad happens, it must be God's fault, so I'm going to reject that. Or there's just an overarching rejection of God in, in, in general. And so at the end of the day, all my decisions, my, 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 my response to the pressure is I serve me. So I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to make sure that I look to myself in order to kind of navigate whatever it is that I'm feeling or pressure at the moment. Now, the soft heart says this. It says, it, it, it's that moment where it says, God serves me. Now, you got to remember something about this one too. This is a spiritually shallow. That's the way Jesus describes this, that it, it is received, but it's shallow. The roots don't grow very deep. It's, it's, and there's a couple of different reasons for this, uh, mostly surrounding time. What happens is sometimes we haven't been in a relationship with God very long. We're in these moments where we're new to, to faith, we're new to following Jesus, and our roots just haven't dug very deep yet because of time. Then there's others 
that fit into this category still because they've not done anything with their time in order to spiritually discipline themselves to grow their roots deep. And so as a result of whether it's new or whether you've been in it for a while and just haven't done anything to deepen, you find yourself in this shallow space. And it's this moment where you begin to say, well, God serves me. That he's here to give me what it is that I need. And it primarily comes when it concerning this is this. God, take away my pressure. God, I need you to remove the heat from me. And so that's this shallow kind of thinking. Then we get into what the, the third seed, which he says is it grows among thorns. It grows among the weeds. And I would just like to, to tell you this one I would call this. It is the spiritually distracted. It's the spiritually weedy. It's the ones that, that live life in the weeds. And so the first one says, I serve me. The second one says, God serves me. God, I need you to take away the heat. The third one then says this, I serve God, but he also serves me. And so here's, here, here's where this one lives. I'm going to kind of make a little, this one lives on a seesaw. This one then becomes transactional. God, I know I should serve you, and because I did, now I'm going to need you to serve me. It, it becomes, I'm going to need a return on my obedience. Because I went to church last week, Oh, and by the way, we prayed every night for dinner. I mean, since, since quarantine, we've begun to, you know, pray for dinner because we actually sat down for dinner. And because I did that, I'm going to need you to what? Give me a return on my investment. But this one starts with what? I serve God. But it's this sense that he also serves me, that I'm going to need something on my return. It's transactional. And so that's our response. So when pressure enters in, I know I should begin with God, but I also know that he's going to be uh, looking to, to exchange something with me. Then there's this fruitful. It's the spiritually mature. It's the one that is growing to maturity in this. And so their response then is this. They kind of have no discussion about it. It is this. I serve God. And the reason why is this. I die to self. It's this concept in Luke chapter 9 when Jesus says, you know what, that in order to follow me, in order to really be able to benefit from the life hacks that I'm going to offer to you, it's this, you got to die to self. And so it's not open for discussion. It's not one of those, well, pressure comes, I'm going to need you to take the pressure from me, or pressure comes. Now, God, I need you to remember that not too long ago, I served you and I served you first. I even did it on the first day of the week. I made sure that you even got 10% of my money before I did anything else. And so I need you to now serve me. This one says, I serve God. And so whatever heat comes, whatever pressure comes, I serve God. And that's the end of discussion. And so here's what we have. We have these different responses, same seed, but we have different responses to the heat or the pressure of the world. Now, here's what James does. James comes in and he's going to talk about this through the lens of wisdom. And what he's talking about here is what do we do, what, what practically do we do when this comes? Because this is unavoidable. And so James comes in and he says, where do you turn when pressure comes? Now, I don't want to get too far ahead, but in James chapter 3, he lays out two different kinds of wisdom. There's only two kinds of wisdom. There is wisdom that comes from above, and there is wisdom that comes from below. There is godly wisdom, and then there is earthly wisdom. And he says, when you have to make a tough decision under some sort of pressure, who or where do you turn? And so each of these has a place that it turns. Well, obviously, here's what happens. This one turns to below. This one says, well, there's really no authority outside of myself. I, I, you know, it, it kind of begins and ends with me. So therefore, whatever I think, or you might have some people that you kind of invited into your circle that you consider wise, not, not in a godly way, but just consider wise. And so you kind of take counsel. But at the end of the day, 
You, you look for hacks. You look for decisions to be made based on this earthly sense of wisdom. And so here's what happens. It starts with me and it ends with me. All my decisions start with me and they end with me. I am my own source of wisdom. The second one, this may shock you, this may surprise you, I'm going to tell you also is a below wisdom. And here's why. Because it starts with God, it mixes in a little bit of God, but it ends with me. It ends with me. So it starts with me, it mixes a little bit of God, and it ends with me. Here's why. Because we've not been, based on time, we've not been out of the world for very long. We've not submersed ourselves into living completely under God's reign or under his truths or those sorts of things. And because we're still shallow, we still have a good sense of the world around us. So this is where we begin to take polls. We take polls on our morality. We begin to take polls on what's right. We begin to take polls, not just with the culture, but we begin to take polls with our feels. Well, I mean, that feels, and so I start with me. I need, I need God, what? I need God to serve me under the pressure. So it starts with me. I'm gonna mix in a little God. Well, I know I've been, I've been kind of starting this faith thing, and, and faith says, you know, that I should consider it joy. But you know, I, I, I don't know, at the end of the day, I've got to look somewhere else that is comfortable to me in order to what? Figure out how to deal with pressure, the decision I need to make, the wisdom comes. And so it's still this below type of wisdom. Then we move to that third soil, here's what we get. It too is a below. That James says, as Jesus lays these out, James is gonna say, that you know what? The pressure of the spiritually distracted, the wisdom is still gonna come from below. And here's why. It starts with God, but like the other, it ends with me. And you go, well, hang on now. I mean, they, they serve God. Even though there's a teeter, there's still. And, 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 and here's what I'm, I'm going to get out on this one. It's, I should do whatever. That has to do with God. I should respond in faith. I should respond in obedience. I should respond in commitment. But what happens is there's the weeds come in, and this becomes a convenience thing. It, it, it begins to take shape in, in conversation like this. Well, I, I know what I should do, but there's kind of a better offer this weekend. There's kind of a better offer. I mean, I mean... What I should do doesn't necessarily mesh with what would meet my needs most right now. And because we spend so much time living in the weeds, we spend so much time living for the world, we spend so much time chasing after the world, we spend so much time pursuing what the weeds offer that at the end of the day, you know what ends up? Jesus says this, it chokes out where you start. That at the end of the day, these needs and, and these things that I want and these things that I've been taught to pursue and the things that are important, even though I've been introduced to God and I know he's supposed to be most important, I know what should happen, it chokes these things. And so again, we find ourselves still looking to the below for our wisdom. And then there's this. They look, what? Above. I start with God and I end with God. Why? Because I died to self. I died to self. And when I understand that I serve God, when pressure comes, I'm going to look for my wisdom from above, meaning that I start with God, and whatever happens, I'm going to end with God. Let me play this out in a practical real quick. Let's just take weekend church. Let's just take Sunday. And, and while I get that attendance may, not, may be the end all, it's just the example I'm going to use. So here's how we do this. Do I go to church or do I not go to church this weekend? Well, obviously here, they're the critic. They're the, they're the skeptic. They have no time for it. So no, this one. Well, I'm going to go, but what? It's, it's here to really kind of serve me. And so I'm going to go and I, I'm going to go with the attitude that I need to get something out of it today. So God... 
I'm here. Now do something for me. These are the people that leave on the on, on at the end of service and go, I didn't really get anything out of this today. I didn't really like the songs, and I didn't really show up to serve or do anything. I, I you know, I, I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't. It didn't. I don't know. It didn't spark me in any way. And they're spiritually shallow because again, it's this concept that God serves me. Therefore, I'm gonna start with God, and 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 but it's gonna end with me. These are the people that says, well. I'll go. I know I should go, but I have a decision to make because there's also something else. And so these are the people that have the same conversation every single Saturday night. Do I go? Do I not go? Hey, what do we got on? Okay, we got a decision. And, and it's questions that they should have moved on from, but they haven't. Why? Because they're still in this mode of where I know I serve God, but I also, I don't know, there's a convenience factor in it. And then this one says, no, I'm a committed person. And not only am I going to go, I'm going to serve and I'm going to give and I'm going to do everything I can to make this not about me. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm, going, to, I'm going to walk in and know that, you know what, I may or may not like or I may not you know, get something, but you know what, it's about honoring God. It's about committing to God. It's about me submitting myself underneath the Lordship of God. And so just in, just in attendance, which again, I don't want to make too big of a deal out of, we begin to see these what? Take real life shape. These, these, the way we look at this begins to affect our decision making. The way we deal with this, not only in a very practical, real attendance kind of way, but these heavier things of pressure, they begin to determine the perspective in which we begin to navigate these things. And here's why. It all has to do with this, the goal of life. The goal. And I'm going to attest that the first three, while very distinctly different, what it's, what's going to happen is that the goal is going to look very similar in all three of these. And here's the goal. The goal is to try to live free from pressure. The goal is to live free from pressure. The first one says, I'm gonna do whatever I can within the concept of me to figure out how to live life on my own, using my own wisdom to live free from pressure. This one says, God, you're here to serve me. Take away, make me free of pressure. God, I've done enough this week in the spiritual bank account for you to free me from pressure. And the end result is what we want is this. We want to be secure. The goal is to be secure. I'm gonna do what I can to do, uh, put the right people around me to free me from pressure so that I can be secure. God, I need you to free me from pressure so I can feel secure. God, I've done enough. I've done some big things for you, so I'm gonna need you to free me from pressure so that what I can feel secure. And here's what happens. This creates massive frustrations in our faith. This is what creates massive frustrations when we get to text like James chapter 1 when he says, consider it pure joy when what? When you face trial. And you go, I, I, I can't compute this. And I'm going to tell you before we get into James chapter 1 next week, it's probably because we're living in this shallow or we're living in this distracted. And until we get to a place where we begin to shift the goal we begin to understand that I serve God and that's the end of it. I begin to look to, a, to above for my, my wisdom, for my decision-making skills. I begin with God and I end with God. And what happens in this is there is a different goal that comes. And here's the goal of this one. This one says, I'm going to try to live free under what? The pressure. And the goal then is not be secure. The goal is be mature. It's be mature. I understand over here that, you know what, this is unavoidable. Which, by the way, some of the frustration that comes in right here is that we're expecting God to give us something he never promised. God never promised that we would have moment or that we would have a life once we have received him God's not, God never says that, oh, guess what? Welcome to a life of no pressures. 
It's this one that understands that pressure is going to come regardless. And so it's not about an exchange. It's not about some, some, some magical uh, removal of that from my life. No, it's I'm going to try to live free under the pressure. And in that, what? I'm mature. And in that, I am aligned with God. I want to bring this to kind of to a close and bring James back in here so we can set up next week. What James is trying to do, and we're going to see this right out of the gate next week. James is trying to help the shallow deepen their roots. See, and the thing about these soils is you don't have to stay here. You can progress through these things. You can move through these things. And so James is going to help the shallow remove some rocks and to till that heart, to till that soil so that they can deepen their roots, so that they can deepen their faith. He's going to come into the weed and he says, hey, I'm going to help you grow out of the weeds. I'm going to help you rise above the weeds so that what? I can move you into a place where you are aligned with God, where you can begin to benefit from all that God has to offer you, these life hacks these moments, and it's not just this one, but you're going to see these unfold, these moments where you can consider it joy when you face various trials, when you face various pressures. But I'm afraid we can't digest James fully, and we can't benefit from James if we don't get to this place where we have a perspective of where we are and how it is I view God and where it is I'm looking to my wisdom and what it is that is my life goal. So here's what I want to ask you as we end. Where are you? Because where you are will not only determine whether or not you benefit from James, it's going to determine whether you benefit, fully benefit, to have that life that Jesus talks about and to have it abundantly. It's going to, it's going to determine how it is that you live into the full life. And so I would, I just want to encourage you to think about this this week and begin to pray over this and say, okay, God, I realize I'm right here, but I'm ready to go deeper. Okay, God, I'm right here. And you know what? Quarantine has really kind of removed a lot of distractions. And so it's prime time to kind of weed the flower beds. Or you know what? I'm spiritually mature right now and I'm going to continue to grow as deep as I can, but I'm also going to reach back into here and help others grow, not so that they can, you know, be where I'm at, but so that they can join me in the life that God has called me to. So I'm so excited about unfolding James underneath this. And I was just so excited about sharing this with you. I know it's a little bit old school and kind of kicks back to, to some classroom, but this I think will shape the way we read this beautiful book of James. I'm really excited about it. So shoot us some questions, shoot us whatever it is that you would like to, to maybe talk on or talk uh, with us about. And we would love to, again, begin to, to shape and give you some life hacks that I think is going to help not just in this season of quarantine, but will begin to help us unfold what God has for us in all seasons of life. Pray with me. Father, we just want to say thank you. We want to say thank you for being a sower of seed. God, I'm grateful that as you walk through this, uh, using this parable for our prayer, God, I'm, I'm grateful that you didn't see the dry soil and didn't throw anything. God, you, you, you throw it out there for all of us. You don't look at the condition of our heart and then decide whether or not to throw seed. You throw it. And so I'm grateful that you love me enough, you love humanity enough to just cast seed, to cast your grace and to cast your mercy and so, Father, I pray over these next several weeks as we work through James that you'll soften our hearts, you'll till our hearts, that, God, we'll, we'll till each other's hearts so that we can begin to not just receive these things, but, God, we can begin to grow these things deeper. And so, Father, our goal is maturity. Our goal is not to live pressure-free. Our, our goal is to live free under the pressure. So, God, help us to do that. We're looking forward to what it is that you're going to do in our lives and the transformation that will come through this beautiful book of James. We pray this through your son's name. Amen. You guys have a great week. Thank you for joining us today. A couple of things before you go. Number one, stay connected. Stay connected with us and stay connected with others. The one way that you can do that is follow us and to like this video. Share this video with someone that you think needs encouragement or needs help through trials this week. 
Also guys, we are still being wildly generous. So there are several ways that you can give. You can go to wellhouse.church slash give, or you can text wellhouse, all one word, to 77977. And we will see you cool cats and kittens next week. 